Well, hello to all the good people in the world. I'm Sunifwa, and welcome to the Sensei What Show, where we'll be watching a variety of videos purely for informative and entertainment purposes. I'll give my reactions along with the commentary, sharing my thoughts and opinions along the way. While you're here, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, so you'll be notified every time I book up something new for you. And since sharing is caring, I care that you share. So go right ahead and share. You can like right now and you can share right now. But in the meantime, in between time, let's get into these videos because I don't want to hold you for too long. Hey, what's up? <laughs> Gotta give y'all some y'all can feel, huh? All right. Welcome to all new subscribers. Uh, I see that I have some uh, new subscribers. So, uh, that's what's up. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so we're going to get into this video because it just landed in my lap today. Um, I'm a fan of the Titanic. The Titanic has been a topic of discussion for some months now. For whatever reason, they want to bring it back out and they want to, you know, I don't know if they lied to us, but, you know, about those billionaires that were supposed to be in that bogus ass um, deep diving machine that um, ended up imploding, or what is it? I think it was imploding. Yeah. But anyway, so this video popped in my lap about the Titanic, and I'm like, you know, okay, so when it comes to black people, unfortunately, a lot of things that happen um, in white history, we don't really um, take seriously or really care that anything about we just learn we have to learn when we're in school so we can pass the test but we're not really trying to you know um you know etch it into our memories forever and things like that or to just like to even research and rediscover and shit like that no um but i did go see that movie in fact i think i cut school to go see that movie with my girlfriend oh back in the day and um I'm talking about the Titanic movie, three hours some movie, okay? And um, I'm I don't remember any black people being in the Titanic movie, so I'm like, was it even any black people that worked in the kitchen or down, you know, when it was pumping the coal or whatever into the um, ship's engine or something? I don't know in the engine area. I don't know, but. I don't recall seeing any uh, black people. Um, but anyway, the video that fell into my lap today is a video talking about the only black passenger that was on Titanic. Like, was this really the only black passenger? Like, for real? Like I said, it could have been a job in the kitchen, the engine room, laundry, anywhere else. Fine. It's deep. But we're going to watch this video together because this is the first time that I'm hearing of a black person that was on the Titanic. Okay, let's learn this together. <laughs> so this is a video about the untold stories of the Titanic. Um, this is on the channel, YouTube channel of Noble Maritime Collection. And uh, they posted seven months ago. So this was before the Ocean Gate situation. But um yeah, they, they, they dropped some gems on us about the only they they, they put the only one. The the one. Okay. So I mean I need to care about the one. <laughs> if I can go see the movie, I mean I went to go see the movie because of who? Leonardo DiCaprio, right? You know what I'm saying? We fuck with him. Okay? So we went to go see the movie because of him. Okay, they need they did when they put him in the movie. But we didn't care about the history behind it. We didn't know that the fathers of the world who created um, the, the way that, you know, do everything as far as education wise, as far as um, monetary, as far as, you know, the Federal Reserve. We didn't know all these people was on the damn Titanic. All right. Let's watch this video. Good evening. I'm Dawn Daniels, Director of Programs at the Noble Maritime Collection, and I am here to welcome you to the Noble On Watch Lecture and Concert Series. We are pleased to present the first lecture in our two-part program, Untold Stories of the Titanic. This program explores stories that you probably haven't heard before about the fateful voyage and its passengers. 
I am delighted to introduce Kelly Carter Jackson, PhD. She is the NACL Assistant Professor of Humanities in the Department of Africana Studies at Wellesley College and is here this evening to present Untold Stories of the Titanic Part 1, The Only Black Passenger. <laughs> Sidebar. I'm watching this lady and it like to me she reading something while she's doing this video. I put so much pressure on myself to try to memorize stuff. <laughs> so it don't look like I'm reading. I just want to, you know, so I like to write down my thoughts before I actually convey them. So sometimes, you know, I forget that, okay? I'm just saying, I, I see the girl read. It's cool to see when people do stuff that I try not to do and, and, and they're professionals. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Untold stories of the type 10. Hello, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited to be able to bring this talk and presentation to you, giving you a whole history of the story of Joseph Philippe Le Marcier Le Roche. So oftentimes when I'm telling people about my research, they'll stop me in the middle of a sentence and say, wait a second. There was a black person on the Titanic? <laughs> and I always do a little chuckle because I think that when we think about the Titanic, we think of it as an affluent space with wealthy people and Europeans, and we typically don't expect to see a black person on the ship. Um, but there actually was, and there's a whole history of who he is, his wife, his family, and his descendants, and I'm so excited to be able to share that story with you today. I think most of us are introduced to the Titanic through history, but if you're like a lot of my students, you know most of this history through him. So if you've ever seen the film Titanic by James Cameron, and I'm sure many of you have, given that it was the first film to gross a billion dollars in profit, um, and when it was debuted again in 2012, it actually debuted another billion dollars. Uh, but it's also become one of the most famous films for its romance between Jack Dawson and Rose DeWitt Taylor. Uh, and I think that when we think of this romance and we think of the soundtrack of Celine Dion and, you know, Rose sort of on the ship with her hair blowing in the wind, it really is one of the most iconic romantic scenes. Facts. <laughs> Whew, that was the part right there. She already know. Women was thinking about being with Leonardo DiCaprio, okay? Sure, sure. I'm trying to In all of cinematic history. And I wonder, what would this film look like? And how would we imagine this film if we were to replace Jack and Rose with the love story of Joseph and Juliet? Mm -hmm. So who are Joseph and Juliet? That's who I want to talk to you about today. When we think about Joseph, Philippe Le Mercier, Le Roche. And I say Le Roche because I'm so used to mispronouncing his name. Oftentimes people think it's La Rouge, but it sounds like Posh, Le Roche. Sorry, y'all. Um, I come every time a black man comes in here with a white woman. He always got to get the least attractive one. It ain't all the time, but a lot of times. Okay? And a lot of times the ones. The black men and the white women end up getting the black men that the black women don't even want. Like, <laughs> so I don't weird ones out there. My baby always be like, man, why you gotta have a white woman? Because ain't no black woman fucking with that. You don't do weird. I mean, unless you can find a weird one. I don't know, but I'm just saying. That woman, y'all lying, no. She was real puffy all up in here. Like, but you know, you just happy to get him one. I know, I know. Let's go. Uh, when we think of Joseph Larache and his French wife, they are a, he is a Haitian man and they are boarding the ship to see his family in the island of Haiti. Mm. It is 1912 and Larache is the only black passenger on the Titanic. Larache and Juliet and their two small daughters, Riol Simone and nearly two year old Louise, are traveling to start new lives. Their second class passengers are the RMS Titanic in route from Southampton to New York City and eventually from New York City on another ship that will take them all the way to their home in Haiti. LaRoche was born in Cape Haitian Haiti on May 26, 1886. Mm. 
Mm. At the age of 15, he traveled to Beauvais, France to study engineering. Mm. And when Laurent struggled to find employment and to overcome discrimination based on his race, he decided to look outside of France to provide for his growing family. And I think this is really important because oftentimes we don't realize that there's discrimination also happening in France as well. And while there are jobs that um, Laurent could take, sometimes he was employed but paid underneath what he should have been paid. And it was a struggle for him, particularly because his youngest daughter was always sickly, and so medical bills were piling up for his family. By the time he decided to look for another place of employment in his home of Haiti, Juliet was pregnant with their third child. I mean, but it's pretty cool to know. Um, you know, everyone in America seems to think that all black people were slaves. Um, but yeah, he's a second class citizen, but you know, he was out here working and, you know, competing for wages out here. Um, shit, black men still underpaid today. Okay, and women even more underpaid. So, I mean, but you know, he was chasing his cheddar. I'm not going to chase your cheddar. I hope you got it. Y'all know the goddamn boat. I have a son who may hope to would be born on the same island as his father. When Laraj's mother learned her son and his family would be making their way to Haiti, she purchased them four first class tickets on a ship called La France. However, at the time, French liners would not allow children to be seated with their parents in the ship's restaurant. And Juliet and Joseph <laughs> did not want their children to be away from them or regulated to the ship's nursery. Ship's nursery. So in frustration, they exchanged their first class tickets for second class tickets on the brand new, new Starliner, the Titanic. Oh, isn't that something? That's juicy. So, they weren't even supposed to be on the Titanic. But all because the, the La France um, ship wouldn't allow their babies to sit in the dining hall and eat with them. They had to purchase tickets somewhere else. I think they got a refund. I don't know how refunds used to go back in these days. But I mm, hope they got a refund. That's, that's bogus. So, they end up getting on that Titanic. Did they survive? We're going to find out. April 10th, 1912, they boarded the ship along with 2,224 other passengers and crew. And of course, they would not know that this ship would go down in infamy for one of the greatest ships to ever have seen. But if you think about what the decisions they were making at the time, they thought they were enacting on the best interests of their children and their family. The story of Larache, his French wife, Julia Lafarge, and their descendants is largely unknown. And it troubles the assumption of an all-white Titanic narrative held commonly in the United States and throughout the world. It is my hope to be able to place Larache in a larger moment, a moment that provides historical context for understanding the macro and micro consequences of black migration and movement. While much has been researched on the Titanic regarding its construction, crew, and passengers, I examine this unexplored aspect of race. For many African Americans, the Titanic represented the ultimate symbol of white hubris. Indeed, in black memory and literature, the Titanic became a miracle of jokes and wrote some legends about a possible black passenger. <laughs> in oral tradition, African Americans had developed a character named Shot. A black man who jumps into the water during the sinking of the ship and saves himself by swimming to shore. That's shine the beast to mock. Well, that's funny. The passengers from lines such as this Captain said, Shine, shine, save for me. I'll make you richer than old John D. Shine turned around and took another notion. Say, Captain, your money's counterfeit in this big ass ocean. <laughs> And these bros were meant to be hilarious, they were meant to be funny, shared among groups of people, and they were meant to mock the idea that people thought a ship could be unsinkable, or mock the hubris of the wealthy, and um, to sort of um, make light of the fact that no black person would find themselves on a ship like this. Man, that's all I'm saying. When the onion put in that little um, article that the um, 
uh, the Titan and Ocean Gate should have been tested with poor people first before putting billionaires on there. Mm mm. Mm mm. No. We, mm, all right, y'all, if y'all watch that video, I don't know how I feel about that. That's not, that's not, yeah, y'all, y'all must not know poor people. That's the problem. Wealthy people don't know poor people. <laughs> they don't know what we will or what not do. They just got their practice. <laughs> Particularly because the shift was so fluent. The practice of marketing in the morning is how many people came to understand the tragedy of the Titanic and Black Thought. The sinking of the Titanic was a small but significant way of assaulting white represent grievances from white terrorism during what Rayford Logan called the new year of racial politics. You say they had a party? And this is a moment in which, you know, it's an intense uh, racial period in American history in which racial violence was quite common. Um, in 1912, Charles Hafer, a black composer, wrote a song about the Titanic, and that song sold 3,000 copies. Black Americans were angered by the humanity of the millionaires. Scholar Lawrence Levine argued that no other contemporary tragedy was as celebrated in black religious song as the sinking of the Titanic. Though LaRoche never stepped foot in America, the connection between the Titanic I didn't know that black people felt this way about the top ten. <laughs> like, God, dog. I mean, I thought it was like I said, a good movie. But, I mean, as far as like all the history behind it, I just never cared to even look into the history. But to know the history that my people was like, they weren't feeling it and they laughed at it and uh, applauded the sinking of the ship like that. That's 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 deep. Making jokes and stuff about it. That's, that's real deep. And I'm here just trying to wonder if we was on a goddamn boat. <laughs> a tannic and black mobility is critical. I think it was widely known that an elite person of African descent traveled aboard the Titanic. It wouldn't matter, particularly for African Americans. For black people, the Titanic was not about tragedy, but about access to spaces white people coveted. So today I really want to explore the life of the one and only black passenger on the Titanic and his family. What must it have been like to travel? Thank you, sister. Thank you. Tell me something. I'm a wild black. I want many considered to be the world's premier ship as the among the world's most wealthiest passengers. It's important to note that the Rosh was not traveling as part of the crew or even in the third class. As I mentioned before, he was traveling second class. He was also part of a black elite. So you mean to tell me that, like I said, couldn't no black people even be on a crew or or a part of third class? Uh -uh. That was the, the original, original blacks. <laughs> them, them, them po whites. They, they was the third, third class. It was the crew members, I guess. I don't know, but they had those horrific jobs before we started getting them. It's so funny <laughs> how black people been wanting to have the opportunities of whites for so many generations and years and years, and you know, here we are. Now y'all don't even want the jobs. Y'all don't even want to work no more. Y'all like, mm -hmm, this working shit is some bullshit. This working shit is slavery. <laughs> At first, y'all wanted to earn a check. Not y'all, but y'all ancestors. Y'all ancestors understood that, you know, it, 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 it means a lot to be able to earn, you know, off of your own labor and to be able to um, you know, feed your family and take care of your family and things like that. But, you know, nowadays it's like, yeah, but you don't got to go work to do all that. You know, you can do other things and still be able to do that. So it's just a new world. But I'm just saying, like, this this is crazy back then, huh? He spoke French and Creole and English. Mm. Laurent was also a descendant of the first ruler of independent Haiti, Jean-Jacques Dessalines. And in 1912, his... Y'all see that? Who he looked like to y'all? He looked like a black version 
on the pole and throw me. I'm just saying. Uncle Cincinnatus Bacon was also the great grandson of Jean Jacques, Jean Jacques Dessalines, was the president of Haiti. His voyage allows us to better understand the possibilities of black advancement in the Titanic. The name looked like Cincinnati, I'm just saying. Panic moment. And I think this is really interesting because oftentimes when I tell people this story, first, they're shocked that there was a black passenger on the Titanic. But second, they're shocked to find out that he wasn't. That's why I'm here. <laughs> That's why I'm here. The crew, that he wasn't, you know, working somewhere down in the belly of the ship, that he was a second class passenger who was gifted and talented and of high class. That's where black excellence come from. I want y'all to know. Back in those European times, when black people were, um, you know, able to go to school and, and work alongside white European people, let me tell you, they had to be the best. Like, they had to excellence. That's where the black excellence come from. Like, you have to be excellent. You can't just come in and just do as they do and then expect to be treated the same. Like, no, you have to be, like, you have to work twice as hard. You have to do twice as much. And you're going to have to, you know, shine twice as hard. Like, so that's black excellence. That's where black excellence comes from. The way y'all talk about black excellence, everybody not that excellent. I'm just saying. I mean, y'all. I mean, in in the light of being positive, yes, you're excellent. But as far as from what they had to do and where you know they were, and you know, if you're not elite, if you ain't out here like really pulling in that bag, then I mean. That, that's the black excellence. Then that's hashtag black excellence. <laughs> Everybody can hashtag black excellence, okay? <laughs> so conversely, LaRoche also demonstrates uh, the limitations of black advancement in a racially hostile world. Mm. Despite his pedigree and personal accomplishments, he struggled to find steady employment in France and was unable to provide for his family, I guess. Even still, even still, he was better than probably most of the citizens in that town and still couldn't even get a damn job. Spoke three languages. Did she say three languages? Still couldn't get a job. Probably played instruments, probably did some fencing, probably did all types of stuff, okay? And still couldn't get a job. That's sad. That prompting the return for him to return home to Haiti in 1912. I think it's not enough to simply state that the Rosh existed. It's more important to address how his existence decenters the U.S. focus of the Titanic narrative and broadens it to include others that can speak to the harsh inequity and possibilities of the lived Black experience. The Rosh's life, uh, un largely unnoted life, demonstrates how we have imagined a land to travel as a set of white privileges. His life story reveals the seemingly inescapable graph of tragedy and demise that follow black people wherever they venture, even in their attempts to travel home. So let's get into who LaRoche was before he gets to France, while he's in France, and then what prompts his return home. In 1901, LaRoche was a brilliant student. He wanted to be an engineer, so he did what others did. As handsome as he wanted to be. Others did when they wanted to pursue their educational and professional pursuits. They left the island. There were no engineering schools in Haiti, and LaRoche traveled with his instructor, Monsieur Cuzon. A whole engineer? Man, that's a gut pain field to be in, right? He couldn't even get a job. That's a bullshit. The Lord Bishop of Haiti, and they lived in his home while attending school in Boute and later in Rio. He attended the graduate school of industrial and commercial studies at Catholic University in Rio from 1904 to 1907, and he completed his three year degree in the area of manufacturing. Right. When he met his wife, Juliette Lafarge, through his instructor, they became friends. 
I ain't gonna hate on her jawline. I mean, it's very profound, but I mean, she probably a really good woman with a really good heart, and she got a small waistline. So, I mean, it's okay her jawline is bigger than her waistline. Like, it's okay. Like, she's good people. After LaRoche graduated school, the couple married in March of 1908 in the home of the Lamars in the city of Bilanji, a city just outside of Paris. In March of um, 1908, LaRoche had found his partner in life, but securing his profession did not come with the same amount of ease. Despite his degrees and qualifications, racial discrimination in France was common and stifling. LaRoche could not find steady employment, and after being on the cheated wages he deserved for his work in talent, he began to become depressed. Employment was not just scarce, it was not scarce for someone of his skills. He knew his talents were needed. And like I said, when he did find work, his employers made excuses that he was young and inexperienced to justify his poor pay. Let me tell y'all something. It's weird, but with a name like Sinequa and having this beautiful melanated skin, I don't have the easiest job or the easy, I don't have the easiest time getting employment as, you know, like callbacks. Um, like a lot of jobs that I end up getting, it's like a divine intervention or usually by, you know, me going to some woman and they pulling me in or something like that. But other than that, let me tell you, my mama did a number on me when she named me Sonequa for one. And then um, for two, you know, I am who I am, a very colorful person. Like, I'm talking about not just the delineation, I'm talking about my personality, <laughs> my hair. Um, my nails is all one color today, but I've been upon people who's the rainbow bright bitch like my whole life, but I'm just saying like so a lot of times I feel like those racial bias people be talking about equal opportunities and shit like that and they job in the nerve for um so yeah Supreme Court so the ruling of the Supreme Court to end affirmative action and make Hmm, U.S. doctors less diverse. Hmm, that's what they saying on that one. But, so, with that situation, okay, like, that really helps white people out more so, or anyone who claims to be white, than it does any minority, okay? Um, not so much as black people, although these affirmative action um, amendments and things like that was fought for in bills and laws passed for, you know, um, black people, but now, you know, it's for immigrants and, and shit like that. But the thing is, is that them getting rid of that is going to lessen the amount, like we said, of diversity of other races getting the chance to get a job. Like already, when you look at most jobs, okay, if it's not black owned, Indian owned, uh, Mexican owned, or Asian owned, it was Chinese, Korean, uh, um, Japanese, whatever. Because a lot of those people, they hire their own people, okay? They do. Black people too. That's why I'm telling my friends, they got businesses, ain't nothing wrong with just hiring, you know, us, okay? Because other races do it for their sales. They hire their own people. So it's okay, okay? But at the same token, I'm just saying when it comes to bigger jobs and corporations or, you know, where the money at, those places are locked down. Like the percentage, like they, they, they could at least if, um, split the percentage of um, races up based off the ethnicity of that city or whatever. Like, let's say, for instance, if you're saying that uh, white people make up 50 percent, black people make up 13.6 percent. Um, and the Mexicans make up, you know, 20% or whatever. Like, that should reflect in your board. That should reflect up in HR. That should reflect up in the county. That should reflect in every department. It should reflect in the whole, like, all jobs. 
You know what I'm saying? It shouldn't be like, okay, when y'all look at, at corporate, there's no, like, black faces. There's no, like, nothing else but just white faces. They were all white. That's what my baby always was saying. Because pretty much, <laughs> everywhere we look, they're all white. <laughs> and so I'm just saying, this racist, like, situation, not racist, but this race bias, um, you know, situations that keep us from getting opportunities, okay, because of our skin, because that's really what it boils down to, because, you know, we're black or back in those times, more, okay? Um, so, you know, but she's saying he was Haitian. Probably won't even claim him being Morris, but I'm just saying that's what they used to call back people back then, you know, those Morris people. But yeah, I'm just saying, like, that's the reason why he was having a hard time getting uh, a job. More so, not because of um, anything, it wasn't about anything else. He, he met the qualifications. I meet mean, the qualifications. I may not have all the degrees and things like that. I speak all different languages, but guess what? I have more experience in my field that I am well reversed in than most doctors who went to school. Like, so, I mean, and that's not me just blowing my horn, but I'm just saying, you know, like, I, whatever. But they do undercut the system as well with pain, okay? And this is why I had to get about of other places, okay, because they'll bring other people in of other, you know, situations, give them more money, especially home people, when they bring their own people in, give them more money, and then they come in and can't do shit, don't know shit, can't do shit, but getting paid more than you. That's fucked up. What is that about? If it ain't color, I'm just saying. And like I said, I know I get skipped over a lot of jobs because of my name off top my name say black okay now you probably got a couple of um white you know sneakers out here in the world you know what i'm saying now because you know the world has changed but i'm just saying i was one of the original you know what i'm saying originator sneaker <laughs> but let's get back to this video okay titanic scholar judith geller claims quote no matter how qualified he was the blackness of his skin kept him from securing a position that paid his I'm work. just saying. So almost a year into his marriage, the 19th of 1909, Julie gave birth to her first daughter, Simone. And 17 months later, Julie... They got their mother's jawline. They so cute. <laughs> they gave birth again to Louise. But Louise's birth was complicated. She arrived prematurely and as a result suffered from health problems the first several years of her life. With each major change in the lives of the LaRoches, the expenses compounded with unemployment or underemployment. Louise's medical expenses were crippled in her finances. They were living with Julia's father, but LaRoche La desperately wanted to be able to provide for his own. I swear the medical industry is a sham. I swear. Like, let's talk about that real quick. It's like, why when you live in a world that actually make money off of your existence, do you have to pay to be well to continue to work for these people so they can take money from you? Like, these are one of the things that citizens nowhere should ever have to be concerned with, paying for health care to be well you know what i'm saying like this helps this helps you right this helps you but it's like we're just in a constant you know state of uh being just drained drained this messed up I, I i mean i don't care about the things that go in the world just a little bit i do i do i do but i'm just saying like not that much <laughs> family. His solution to his problems prompted him to return home to Haiti. And it's interesting because LaRoche is writing to his family and he's telling them that he wants to come home 
we found a, a, a copy of a postcard from his cousin that is encouraging him and telling him, don't worry, one day you'll be able to return home, one day you'll be able to come back to Haiti. But the idea that Haiti was a goal of his, I think, is really important to know that he was not necessarily set on settling in France, at least not forever. So we know that because if the Laroche could find work in his virtually all black homeland, his uncle and the president of Haiti promised to appoint him as a professorship, as a mathematician, and pay him $200 a month, which was more than a modern salary at the time. In time, his uncle informed him that he could eventually work his way up to headmaster if he chose. Juliet agreed to make the trip again and to make Haiti their new home. They planned to leave in 1913. But when Julia discovered that she was pregnant with their third child, they decided it was better to travel pregnant with two children than to make the long, laborious trip with three little ones in tow. And as a mom of three, I can tell you, you will be outnumbered very quickly. <laughs> so the excitement and the anxiety that um, filled them as they made their plans to travel to this new land, as you can imagine, was one that they all thought about constantly leading up to their day of travel. When they finally boarded the Titanic at 7 p.m. on April 10th, after taking a train from Paris to Chabord, an unimaginable sight, an unimaginable sight was before them. Derived from the Greek mythology, the RMS Titanic meant gigantic. And Juliet wrote to her father, quote, if you could see this monster, our tender looked like a fly compared to her. She told him that their arrangements could not be more comfortable and that she counted. You know what they say, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. At least 20 other children in second class accommodation there as well. And this is also interesting because if you've ever had trouble with children, you know how important it is to have other children around that can keep your children company, that can entertain, they can entertain one another as they make this long, uh, several week long trip. Interestingly, scholars have noted that nowhere in the copious press covers of the ship and the interviews for survivors was a black family ever mentioned. The White Star Line was known for passengers and crew calling racial slurs at various ethnic groups. In fact, the White Star Line was forced to apologize to its crew's derogatory comments made about Italians. And but Titanic scholar Judith Geller claimed, quote, the only known Yeah, I know Italian was on there too, huh? Yeah. Don't tell them that. <laughs> they hate us. I mean oh no, it's like everyone is taught to hate us. But, like, why? Such lovely people. The mention of Simone and Louise LaRoche was made by Jay Foss in a letter home. Quote, there are two of the finest little Japanese girls, about three or four years old, who look like dolls running about the ship. And I think this is interesting because the girls are mixed race and they were very fair skinned. So oftentimes, when standing with their mother, people were not able to decipher what their ethnic background was. And standing with their father, they might have been a little bit even more confused. But as the girls grew into adults, Simone and Louise remained very fair skinned. And it was never really clear or readily present what their racial background was other than white. And particularly, people would assume they were white when standing next to them. See what I'm saying? Mm, mm, mm. The confusion begins. Mm, mm, mm. To their mother. So, as they're on the ship, four days into their travel, on April 14th, the voyage, um, and 14 day, four days into their voyage, the unthinkable happened. The Titanic struck an iceberg at approximately 11.40 p.m. There was no way to recover. The collision forced the ship's hull's plates to collapse inwards. Five of the Titanic's 16 watertight seaside compartments opened. The ship only had capacity to maintain four flooded compartments. Oh. Panic spread throughout the ship within minutes. Of the 2,222 passengers, 
It is estimated that only 705 people were rescued from lifeboats that boarded the uh, and were able to board the Carpathia. Julia and her two daughters were among those survivors. In an interview for La Matin, Julia was beside herself. Through her sobs, she recalled the terror she experienced. Quote, people jostled each other. They were completely engulfed. Crowded by people on every side of her, Julia did all she could to keep her children close by. The pushing and the shoving was unbearable. And Julia was not only struggling to keep her daughters by her side, she was also early in her pregnancy. Julia and Simone were separated from Joseph and Louise and literally thrown into a lifeboat. Just as Julia secured herself and Simone, she saw on a bridge through the crowd Joseph. He was holding on to Louise with everything he had, trying to protect her from the constant pushing. As he neared his wife, he had a confrontation with one of the sailors. He was trying to convince them that his daughter and his wife had been separated from him. It was likely the crew did not readily believe that Louise was his daughter, or perhaps that this white woman was not his wife. Either way, now was not the time to play identity politics. There was panic all around them. Chaos ensued everywhere. As he continued to plead his case, someone seized Louise and placed her in the arms of Juliet. Juliet had little time to speak to her husband. Within minutes, the rowboat was descending toward the sea with a rapid sea. A speed. How would she find him? How would he find them? Which lifeboat would allow him to board, particularly as a black man? And above all the noise, Juliet heard Joseph shouting about words of encouragement. See you soon, dear. That's so messed up. He assured her. There will be room for everyone in the lifeboat. Look after our girls. See you soon. And with that, the rowboat plunged into the sea. Now we know that man, y'all hear that? This will make a good movie though. It would. Like seriously, if they were to do a movie based off of this situation, um, that'd be interesting to see. I hope they do. During this particular time, women and children were said to have been put in life boats first. So with that, we knew that the opportunity for Joseph to get in a life of himself would also be um, slightly restricted. And we know that his race would have possibly restricted him even more. So we're not clear as to what happened to Joseph. So sad. All he wanted to do was go back home to Haiti and end up dying tragically. Come out so we don't know what happened to him. And fish food. Rush, if he were to go, if he was down with the ship, uh, but we know that he drowned and did not survive. Um, but all during the commotion, and if you remember, it's the middle of the night, it's past midnight, it's 1 a.m., it's 2 a.m., um, Juliet has no idea what is happening to Joseph, where he is, or where he might be. Poor Julia. Now she's stuck with three kids and no husband, right? And she only agreed to go to Haiti, you know, to be with her family. Like, I don't know if she went back to Europe or what to be back with her family. Y'all. I mean, because she can't go to Haiti. I, I don't know what happened. Oh, Julia. A day broke. Julia searched the horizon for the silhouette of the Titanic. She thought they must have rode a great distance away from the ship. She never witnessed the ocean swallowing the great liner. She recalled hours past like centuries, until finally at seven in the morning, deliverance arrived. Officers of the RMS Carpathia told the rescued not to worry. Quote, other ships for Saradamas have gone to the Titanic and are at this moment on their way to New York, where you will meet them all again. The crew gave everyone false assurances. And part of this was because they wanted to keep the passengers calm. When the remaining survivors reached New York City, they learned to come. Do you prefer people to lie to you to keep you calm? Or do you prefer if someone just tells you the truth? 
in a calm manner and you know just try to you know get you to just be cool about it like i, I want to know the truth personally I, i'm option b god damn it that's what i am like tell me the truth like don't lie to me i mean and it, just let me deal with it from that point okay mm -mm. creature that there would be no husbands brothers or fathers waiting for them and no ship that would be arrived after them mm. Larage was lost to the sea, and Juliet was all in her own. New York City was a foreign place to Juliet. In the panic to leave, Joseph had thrown off his coat and kept all of their money hey. and precious jewels on his person. Oh my God! Are you kidding me? So when he pushed his wife with his two children and, and the one soon to come on that boat, and he knew he wasn't going to get off that goddamn boat. He had to know that he wasn't going to get off that damn boat. He could have given her all the money and the jewels. Now, if they ain't like a nigga, I ain't, boy, I tell you right there, boy, he bogus in the mother. Juliet was penniless and pregnant. She also did not speak English. It took her about three weeks for her and her girls to make the return trip to Paris on a French liner called Chicago. I'm so sorry. I'm just so sorry. He like, you know what? He was gonna go down with his own money and, and, and jewels. He was, or maybe he just wasn't thinking he was in panic, but. For him to be so smart and speak so many languages, I would have thought that, you know, but just because people go to school and read books and, and, and got all these degrees don't make it smart. I'm just saying. <laughs> common sense ain't coming. <laughs> okay. And if you can imagine having this, you know, horrible act happen to you, this trauma, and then weeks later having to board a ship again, hoping that there's not a repeat of PTSD. What happens? This ship home could be nothing but terrifying and also grievous, and the fact that they were still mourning the fact that her husband and the father of her children was not with them. When she arrived in Paris, her father was waiting for them, equally grief stricken. She told her father that Joseph had endeavored to reassure her and <clears throat> reassure her and asserted her that he would uh, have been saved as she was. Through her tears, Juliet could not stop repeating in her pain. I believed him. I believed him. If she had known what was about to happen, she would have never agreed to leave him. Juliet blamed herself for her husband's death. She believed that had she not insisted on changing their tickets from the trams to the Titanic, all of this could have been avoided. Aww. And while historians rarely engage in counterfactuals, Destruction still could have followed them. Just four months after the Titanic sank, Lavash's uncle and the president of Haiti was assassinated. Lacan died in what many suspected to be foul play. There was a bombing that happened in the palace, an explosion that took place at the palace that killed uh, the president and several of his cabinet members. Furthermore, few years after that, Jewish occupation of Haiti began in 1915 and lasted about 20 years until 1934. So even if they had made it to the island of Haiti, politically, socially, and even economically, their lives would have been quite precarious. Hmm. After the Titanic, Juliet helped pledge, uh, uh, Juliet pledged to leave the past and pass. She was intensely fearful of journalists. She hated recounting her story. And that's understandable. She blamed herself. She wanted to be left to grieve her husband without a spectacle. She told her children to never speak of the Titanic. She not only suppressed their past, but she also buried it. Literally, in 1940, when Nazi Germany invaded France, Juliet lived in fear that authorities would not only be seeking out Jewish people, but anyone who seemed different. She worried that people would question the complexion of her skin's daughter. 
skin, her daughter's skin. So she buried her suitcase in the backyard that contained every single picture or image that would have linked her children to a black father. Oh, oh my God. Once again, anti-blackness placed LaRoche's family at risk. The suitcase remained buried in the backyard for six years. And Always in six years. What are they, they going to be throwing them numbers out there? Until she was assured that the Nazis would have returned. So I want to think about some conclusion ideas as we think about what it means to be black on a ship called the Titanic and what your experience might be like. We do know that while Mirage was on the ship, he was treated very well. He engaged with a lot of the um, wealthy people and powerful people on the ship who were impressed by his ability to speak multiple languages. But in the end, none of that could save him from the sinking of the ship. And oftentimes I think that we are unaware that there was a black person on the ship because his wife was French and their daughters almost looked white. And so we don't have something that readily points or triggers to us to a black family on the ship. But I think oftentimes when we think about our, uh, our fascination with the Titanic, our obsession with this unsinkable ship, it also encapsulates how much we understand about power and whiteness and privilege. I think Warash connects many black people to a moment that until recently, he did not warrant any collective black remorse. But oftentimes, I make the argument that you really can't separate race and mobility. Often, they are tied together hand in hand. So I ask the question when thinking about who Larash is, I ask, who gets to move to certain places? Who has to stay in certain places? Who gets to decide who's pushed into another place, who's pulled into another place? And most importantly, how do we decide who gets access to some of the most coveted spaces? And those coveted spaces aren't just limited to the Titanic itself. Those coveted spaces were limited to the lifeboats in the aftermath of the sinking of the Titanic. I think these are all questions worthy of thinking about, worthy of our investigation. But most importantly, I'm happy to be able to introduce someone that people may not be aware of, the life of Joseph Philippe Marcio Lamache, his wife, Juliet, and their daughters, Simone and Louise. I'm really happy oh, to have this time to share with you today. I hope you will take this information and look a little, a little bit deeper and further to find out more information, not just about the Titanic, but about the passengers on the Titanic as well. Thank you. Well, thank you for that informative information. <sighs> there we have it. I mean, I don't know. Like I said, I never knew it was black people on the Titanic. I didn't recall seeing them in the movie. Um, I feel like I need to watch the movie again just to, to see if any black people was on the movie. But I don't think they was. So I didn't even think that there were any black people on the Titanic at all. But we found out today that uh, LaRouge, Joseph LaRouge, I ain't going to try to say his whole name, he was on the boat and he was a black man. And um, yeah, the only black passenger on the dang gone Titanic who, um, like she said, with all his um, advantages and accolades and um, education and you know, uh, uh, languages he learned and everything like that, he still couldn't, you know, say, you know, a lot of people, actually. I mean, I think she said it was like 2022 people on the boat. Is that what she said? And then, like, only 600, 75, like 700 some people actually survived in the end. Um, so, I mean, you know, a lot of people died. A lot of people died. Unfortunately, um, not even the one only black passenger on the Titanic couldn't be saved. Affirmative action didn't help him out. <laughs> anyway, thanks for stopping by the Say Say What show. And we have a blessed day. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe so you can notify. 
And uh, yeah, share. It's okay. Do it now. Bye-bye.